I want to just make sure people have a chance to say hello and network with us before the meetup starts. Yeah, um, I'll start. Um, you can probably see my I'm a new face. Um, but yeah, so my name is Bernard Schwab. Um, I'm from Canada, Vancouver, Canada. Um, came across this, uh, uh, um, just the, um, I guess the title and it screamed uh, me, right? So <laughs> I, I saw it on Meetup and I just thought it'd be the perfect opportunity to sort of get some insight from uh, other people in the industry and, um, you know, that deal with uh, ADHD like myself, right? Uh, it can definitely, I always find it can definitely be a really good thing. And then some other times it can be uh, a challenge that needs overcoming. So I'd be, yeah. I'm excited to hear what everyone has to say. For sure. Anyone else want to go next? You gotta volunteer someone. <laughs> All right, you're up, Omri. <laughs> sure. Oh, give me a second. Oh, my camera's not showing, huh? Okay, that's annoying. Um, let me. Yeah. So my name's Omri. I'm from LA. I've actually met VJ in person, which is so rare to say these days. <laughs> I haven't been to a JavaScript LA slash HackBuddy meetup in a little in a, in a little while now, just because I've been you know busy going to other meetups and being on Slack channels and all this fun stuff. Um, but I still do have some some semblance of a soft spot for JavaScript. And when I saw um, the title for the talk, I, 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 Brennan, I'm in the same boat as you. I was like, okay, I, I have to check this out, like because I do. I am diagnosed with ADHD, um, and I wanted to see what uh, Chris has to say. So happy to be Good stuff. here. Yeah, glad to have you back. And um, it is rare to see me and, you know, we'll we'll figure that part out later. Like in-person meetups have been being asked for. Um, but yeah, definitely, uh, this is an exciting talk. And I, I definitely think like it has a lot of value for people with ADHD, you know, so I'm excited too. Anybody else want to go next before we start? I can go. Okay, good. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name's Adam. I guess I'm based out of Orange County, California. Uh, I've been a big fan of, of Chris. I've, I've followed uh, Go Make Things for, for a few years now. Uh, it's made me, it coming from a, a junior developer who was thrown jQuery and didn't fully understand jQuery to being able to read a lot of those articles and finally understand vanilla JavaScript. Uh, and feel a little more confident about jumping into to frameworks like Vue or React uh, have helped me. Uh, so, you know, thanks, Chris. <laughs> uh, uh, but glad yeah, to no, hear it. Just, just glad to, yeah, just excited to hear what's going on every time, you know, I, I hear something from you, I learned. Even, uh, was it the Dev Discuss podcast recently? The, the round table on jQuery was a really, really cool talk. So, cool, good discussion. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Awesome. Yeah. Um, at this point, Chris, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. If you want to take more, um, you know, uh, questions or networking, feel free to, but it is your um, meetup at this point. <laughs> oh, yeah, cool. Um, did I remember to unmute myself? I did. Awesome. Um, yeah, I am. Um, uh, forgive me. I am. Um, I thought this was going to be a bit of a Q&A format, at least that's the way um, uh, it was described to me. Um, so I don't have, you know, I'll ramble for a little bit because that is one of my ADHD superpowers. And literally at any moment, um, if anybody wants to, please feel free to interrupt me because um, I'll probably just keep going forever if you don't. Um, <clears throat> but just a little bit of background. Um, so for people who don't know me, uh, Chris Ferdinandi, I, um, as was just mentioned, I teach people JavaScript, typically of the vanilla variety. Um, and I believe that there is a simpler and more resilient way to build things for the web. Um, I, I've kind of come to realize really just over the last year or so that um, I think a lot of the, a lot of the appeal of like shedding a lot of the tooling and just kind of being really like narrow and focused is probably out of necessity because of my ADHD. Um, uh, I, I just, I find that like really complex tools and processes um, 
are just hard for me to wrap my head around and um, uh, hard for me to learn and um, hard for me to just like keep track of all the moving parts. Um, and so I, I, I've kind of come to think that a lot of my preferences are, are in part driven by that. Um, there's also some ideological stuff around developer experience or user experience and things like that. But um, that's not what this talk is about. Um, so I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was a kid. Um, this was during the 80s when there was like a real big, well, there was two things happening. Uh, ADHD has probably been around for a really, really long time, but it didn't have a name or wasn't even really recognized as a thing until like the 70s, 80s. And so um, around the time that I was diagnosed, it was still a thing that was a bit of a stigma. Um, so it was common. This was like around when like Ritalin was like a thing. So it was really common for kids to get over medicated and like turn into zombies. So my mom never pursued that. She also never let my teachers know because she didn't want like the stereotype of having ADHD, which at the time was just called ADD to follow me around. Um, most of my teachers probably knew anyways, because I was a stereotypically ADHD kid. Um, even now you can probably notice I'm like swiveling in my chair. I could never sit still. So like, I'd be like rocking and like clicky pens are my, my enemy because I will just like click them constantly. I'm very fidgety. Um, uh, and it's the only way I can focus. Um, but there was also kind of this other thing happening where uh, because the symptoms in boys are usually a lot more on the hyperactive end of the spectrum. And with girls, they're usually um, more like uh, mental hyperactivity, but they don't always manifest with the same physical kind of attributes. It tends to get overdiagnosed in boys and underdiagnosed in girls. Um, and so there was also this like backlash movement of ADHD is not a real thing. It's just doctors trying to like give a medical condition to boy, the whole boys being boys nonsense, right? So um, yeah, so I never took medication for my ADHD. I learned a bunch of like workarounds. Um, I've got to be honest, a lot of them were like basically just me being a privileged white male who was able to like I don't know, just kind of like plow through it in a way that like um, women or people of color might not be able to. And so I just want to fully acknowledge that up front. I also don't have any issue with medication. I know a lot of people who take it and find it really works for them, but um, it's honestly, it's something I've been exploring for myself lately, but um, it's just not a thing I take. Um, and also just normal caveats here. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not giving medical advice. I'm just kind of talking about my own lived experience. Everybody's ADHD experience is a little bit different. Um, so I'm just going to shut up with my intro for a second. Um, and if anybody who's here has anything they'd like to ask, talk about, unpack, have me cover as part of this, now would probably be a good time to just kind of pause. Cause I literally, I won't pause if no one makes me. So I'm going to, I'm going to force myself right now. Um, <laughs> we can go from there. Yeah. Um, real quick, I'll just, uh, say to, um, new people coming in, um, we just started the meetup. Uh, so this is more a just kind of like have fun and, um, you know, ask some questions, um, get to know about ADHD as well as, um, you know, Chris's JavaScript podcast and, you know, some of the work he's been doing for Vanilla JS. So um, I think we'll just go a little bit freeform today. Um, you know, if there's anybody here who has like a question, just feel free to ask. And I will also just kind of like uh, watch the chat here and just if there are questions that come up, I'll ask the questions too, in case you're shy or maybe your mic doesn't work. I also do see a question or two in the chat that um, I missed because I was busy rambling. Um, oh, good. Yeah, it's from Omri right here. Yeah, uh, so stimulus. Um, no, I don't like stimulus. I like stimulus in theory. Um, I was really excited when it came out. Um, yeah. Oh, so the question, if anybody didn't see it, the question is, if I like vanilla JS, do I like stimulus? So um, just soapbox for a second. Um, stimulus is one of those things that uh, it's, it's cool in concept. Um, and I actually like some of the ways they've abstracted out um, or some of the ways they approach kind of handling things. But in my mind, I am, um, I tend to be even more of a purist than stimulus is. I like I like my JavaScript to be JavaScript. I like my HTML to be HTML. And stimulus approaches it in a way that I just find uncomfortable to author in. Um, no, no hate if you enjoy it. Um, it's just not my cup of tea. 
Um, I think the other kind of the other angle for me um, at this point is anything like base camp associated has kind of a, a bad taste for me now. Um, and I just generally shun all of their stuff, which is probably a little bit like throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but um, which, wow, is a really terrible, as I said, <laughs> a really <laughs> terrible um, like metaphor, but, um, but yeah, just not, not my cup of tea. Um, <laughs> well, if we want to follow up on this, anything that's, you know, more in depth, are you on the discord? Can we ask you questions there? Uh, I'm not, but I could be, and you can. Um, that's totally fine. I'm happy to. I'm also happy to unpack this a little bit more um, as well. Oh. Yeah, I mean, we can I get to this code link for sure. Okay. I also noticed the code goddess has her hand up, um, uh, and I did see a comment from her that I'm speaking her story. So I'd love to, if you have something you'd like to say, by all means, please feel free. Hey, sorry, I had to get my stuff kind of set up here. No, I'm um, good. Yeah, so you you were absolutely like speaking my story where I didn't even know that I was diagnosed with ADHD, but my parents did. And they were so proud of themselves for not medicating me, but I struggled. I struggled the whole time. And, you know, I thought I was dumb was basically how I, I you know, <sighs> life. And even when I did get the diagnosis <clears throat> in my 20s, I still just thought it meant that I wasn't maybe as smart as everybody else. And I know for me, the pandemic broke me. It absolutely broke me because I was high functioning. I had learned because I'd never had anything, um, you know, any medications or anything. I, I was high mm -hmm. functioning and I figured out how to do stuff and motivate myself. But it just like for the first three months, I'm not sure I did any work. You know? So, um, yeah, you know, the other, um, you know, as you're, as you're talking, one of the other things that kind of came to mind, and thank you for sharing that, by the way, um, I, I feel like that's very common for people who grew up at a certain time. Um, and um, uh, one of the other things I've, I've heard may not or may, may or may not have been your experience, but it's very common for ADHD folks, women more so than men, to like, if you take an IQ test, like actually test really high and then have people kind of dismiss your struggles as just you being lazy or whatever, because like, oh, you're so smart. You're just not trying that hard, which really, really sucks. I'm trying really hard not to swear. It's like my natural, natural tendency is to, to swear a lot. Um, but um, yeah, I, um, I can remember just finding anything that I found even mildly boring, found, find. Anything I find mildly boring is really, really difficult. Um, uh, so the pandemic thing is interesting because I had been a fully remote employee for like five years before the pandemic hit. And it actually worked really well for me because I find offices incredibly distracting. Um, so if you're someone who doesn't have ADHD or you do, and you don't know it yet, um, uh, one of the things with ADHD is, um, just definitionally, actually, I should probably start there real quick. Um, ADHD is a really crappy name for what it is. So it stands for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but ADHD isn't actually a deficit of attention. Um, it's a challenge with regulating it. And so um, if you find something boring, it can be incredibly tough to focus on it. And easy tasks can feel really impossibly difficult just because they're super, super boring in your brain. It's like, F that, I do not want to do that. Um, but if you find something interesting or exciting, um, the ADHD brain can switch modes and go into this thing called hyperfocus, where you actually dive so deeply into it that you forget or ignore everything else, including like food, going to the bathroom, whatever. So like ADHD can actually be, and someone mentioned this earlier on, that ADHD can feel like a superpower sometimes, um, where like if you can get yourself in hyperfocus mode, you can get so much work done. Um, like I've had days, weeks, months where I have like run circles around my coworkers. And then I've had days, weeks, months where I get nothing done. So just by way of example, um, uh, my wife and I have been toying with like kind of RVing for a little bit. And um, I have become obsessed with camper van conversions. And for the last four days, I have gotten nothing done because I cannot stop myself from watching YouTube videos on camper van conversions. I know I have all this stuff I need to get done. And I am just not doing it because I cannot, like just physically cannot stop myself 
from like the allure of this more interesting thing. And it's really tough when you're a computer worker because like the computer is both a work device and a really expensive toy that's always on and right in front of you. Um, uh, sorry, it was a t this is the, I did the tangent thing. So yeah, um, I was fully remote. And then um, with COVID, everybody else who was not remote is now in my house. And so it went from being this really quiet place where I can get a lot of stuff done to this really noisy, distracting place. Um, and so for me, it's it's been a little bit tougher in that regard because it used to be a very like peaceful place where I was largely uninterrupted and it is very much not that and hasn't been for like two years. Um, so I feel your pain. I'm really sorry I took like eight minutes to <laughs> circle back around to that. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm seeing. Oh, sorry. Oh, go, go yeah. Ahead. So I just, um, you know, like just to help kind of steer like the meetup to, you know, um, I could you uh, kind of just, you know, talk to us a little bit about like, um, you know, how you found, you know, vanilla JavaScript and like made your, you know, claim mm -hmm. fame and, you know, how you kind of focused your energy on that. That would be really great too, especially for a lot of the newcomers coming in. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> Just to give so, yourself an intro, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, because I kind of just <laughs> meandered right over that. No, it's um, okay, it's all good, yeah. No, no, yeah, so I am, um, I, probably because of my ADHD, I, um, I kind of hate corporate life um, and always have. Um, meetings and kind of all the like, <sighs> The, the posturing and like needless kind of like nonsense. Like work has always felt like a lot of nonsense for me. Um, not work like specifically, but like corporate life. Um, and um, where that really kind of like came to a head for me, um, I was working at Constant Contact, the email marketing folks, and they have an amazing learning culture. It was a really great team. Um, but uh, I had been working remotely before I got hired there. And during the interview process, I asked my manager like a bunch of times, like, uh, you know, like I'd like to, you know, explore remote work. And, you know, she was like, yeah, after you get settled, we can talk about that. And every time I'd bring it up, we're like, not yet. And then finally I was like, so wh when is it gonna be yet? And she's like, well, we don't really do remote work here. Um, and this was a company where they had like Xboxes set up all over the place and old school arcade machines and happy hour Fridays and like just all this, like, like there was a ski ball machine in the building. Right. And um, they'd even toyed with putting like a slide down to the, like the lower floor on there. It was like a, a fun workplace. Right. So they were totally cool with like me, like literally blowing two hours on playing video games, but not working from home. And, um, I quit like a week later, but um, I also, um, that was like the moment for me where I was really like, you know, I want to, I want to have my own business at some point. I just want to have more control over like what I do and when. Um, and so I started working with a business coach, Jonathan Stark, who was awesome. You can find him at jonathanstark.com. Um, and at the time I was really focused on web performance and um, in exploring web performance, I had found an article from Dave Rupert that talked about how he ripped jQuery out of his WordPress site and his page load time, uh, you know, decreased by like a good, like one to three seconds. Um, and so that kind of sent me down this path of learning vanilla JS. And, um, <clears throat> so I started writing all these articles on, you know, how to do jQuery thing in vanilla JS. Um, and so when I started working with Jonathan, I was really focused on this idea that I was going to be like a web performance expert. And um, he met me at you know, our first meeting. He's like, oh, I know you. You're the vanilla JS guy. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I really want to talk to you about is. And then we spent like six months exploring that. And then like working with nonprofits and working with animal rescues and working with doggy daycares and like all this other stuff. Um, and uh, then one day I was like, yeah, let me look at my analytics. I haven't looked at them in like eight months. Um, and I realized that eight of the 10 most popular articles on my site were how to do this thing you used to use jQuery for without jQuery. And I was like, oh, maybe, maybe he was onto something with that vanilla JS guy thing. And that kind of like kickstarted the whole like real focus on that for me. Um, and this was at a time when ES5 had just come out. So um, things that used to be really, really hard, like selecting an element by a class were a lot easier than they had been just like a year or two before. Um, and uh, JavaScript has only gotten more and more 
powerful and popular since then. Um, so um, I'm never at a deficit of things to learn. And so I think in that regard, um, like one of the things that drew me to development in general, because I used to be an HR guy, um, was the fact that there's just always something new and interesting to learn. Um, but uh, as someone with ADHD, that is also kind of like a nightmare situation because it's really easy to just jump from one thing to another and never really like master anything. Um, but uh, with vanilla JavaScript, because the platform is constantly evolving, all the stuff I learned before never like gets old or becomes useless. Um, but there's always something new to dig into if I really feel that need. Um, yeah, this is great. I, I love hearing this history. I, you know, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's pretty cool that, you know, like you found like vanilla JavaScript and you were doing stuff like thinking about like jQuery at that time and like how to translate that back to vanilla JS. Um, you know, just, uh, I mean, like, you know, do you, why, why do you kind of like teaching? I just wanted to ask that as well. Like, you know. Yeah, sure thing. I also see a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah, I want to make sure we'll, we get to them. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, for me, teaching is, um, teaching is a couple of things. So um, I have found that I don't really fully understand something myself until I try to teach it. Like, I'll think I'll have an understanding of something. And then I go to write down in an article, like how it works in a way that, um, well, so just taking a step up for a second, one of the things I found really challenging about learning JavaScript is that so many of the articles are written with like a, just do this really complicated thing that I already know, so I take for granted is easy for people. Like that used to just break me, like the simply do X, Y, Z. Um, and so I, I really try hard to make sure my articles and tutorials and courses and all that aren't written or um, produced like that. Um, and um, oftentimes I find when I'm trying to explain something I've just learned in a way that would be approachable for beginners, I discover that I don't know it as well as I have, or like I'll start to write something. And I'm like, well, why is that? I just kind of took it for granted, but someone might ask why, so why? And then I have to go like dig into that a little bit more. And so teaching really helps me learn things myself more deeply than I would otherwise, um, because I have to break it down into its simplest components, build it back up in a, um, a more clear way. Um, the other thing that um, teaching does for me um, is I, I gave up on trying to follow everything new that happens in the industry a long time ago because it's just overwhelming and super distracting. And in teaching, I find that the really important stuff seems to bubble up because my students will ask me about it. And I've never heard about, if I've never heard about it, it then becomes a thing I can go look into. Um, uh, so it's been really good um, in that way too. By the way, I realized I never mentioned, um, if anybody wants to actually learn more about what I do, um, you can head over to gomakethings.com. Um, if you head to uh, gomakethings.com slash JavaScript LA, you'll also find a bunch of like resources related to ADHD and a bunch of other stuff we're probably gonna talk about um, uh, today. Uh, you can with or without the dash, either one will get you there. Awesome. All right, let's go to some questions. Um, thanks for the intro. Like, I, I just wanted you to like say, you know, a little bit more about you, just in case, you know. No, 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 for sure. I did a really bad job introducing myself. It's all um, good. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So we got one from. Uh, I think we have one earlier from uh, Fred. Uh, did you have a question? Yes. Hi. Um, hello from San Diego. <laughs> hello. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I kind of would like to maybe refocus it back on the topic ADHD, which kind of I've been sort of uh, dealing with myself for quite a while. And, and this is definitely you're right. This is something that it just kind of, you know, because I've been programming now for 22 years, despite that. And I, I really noticed the, the, the selective kind of selective focus. Like, like, you know, cause I, you know, programming, I've been, I've, I've been doing a lot. I'm old school Java guy. And then I switched to J Java. I mean, JavaScript, you know, we I used to do flash back in the day when it was flash and switched to, you know, jQuery. Now, now I'm pure, you know, all the frameworks react, you know, whatever. So anyways, so kind of like this, when you, when you learn something new, just like you, you know, I would, mm -hmm. I would just spend like the time would just disappear. You would just watch the videos, read blogs you know yeah. spend like hours on you know online just building prototypes and it's like so cool and then when it comes to like 
because you know when you work for corporate stuff there's a lot mm -hmm. of mundane work a lot of maintenance stuff you know mm -hmm. that, a lot of you know you get this huge log of you know of of of, of tickets you got to take care of and your body just resists it you know you're just like oh man it's like you find every <laughs> excuse not to do it it's like you, you yeah. check your instagram you check your you know your email you, you go grab like 10th cup of coffee you know but the work mm -hmm. so it's like so you know what i'm talking about so it's like how do you do you have any tips on like how would you kind of refocus rechannel maybe your your your, your energy yeah to, to overcome this resistance because i've taken a lot of like productivity courses and like our company gave us some like really good time management and it's really not about time management or productivity mm -hmm. it's really kind of like forcing yourself to kind of like find this mundane stuff, you know, energy and focus for this mundane stuff. So really, I'm kind of wanting to hear your point. Yeah, of view. that's great. Um, I mean, it's not great that that happens to you, but I can 100% relate. Um, so there's a few things that um, have worked for me personally. Um, I like that you brought up the productivity thing because I've looked at a bunch of productivity systems in the past myself. Um, when I got my first corporate job, I actually started blogging because I started Googling how to actually get things done. And that led me to the world of productivity bloggers. And I thought to myself like, oh, this looks cool. I wanna blog, um, but about HR stuff. Um, but um, the thing I found is if you, if you, any productivity system that has too many moving parts then becomes a thing I hyper focus on instead of the actual work. It just becomes the thing I like, I'm more focused on maintaining the productivity system. So those don't work for me. Um, I have found that um, more than anything else, just a simple like bulleted list of things to get done is the most effective system. I actually think paper and pencil work best for me, but I always forget to have them with me when I need to write stuff down. And if I don't dump it immediately out of my brain, I forget it. So um, I use the Microsoft to-do app, um, which used to be a uh, wonder list. Microsoft acquired the team and forked them out into a new product. Uh, I like it because it is free. It is the closest thing to a no nonsense paper to-do list I've found. And it includes what I think is the most important feature for me, the ability to have a um, what are you doing today subsection uh, so like I'll create a bunch of lists for different things. And then every morning I just go through my, my whole, like my collection of everything and just swipe what directions, the swipe right on the things I want to get done that day. And it pulls them into this other little list for you, keeping them in their original context. So I can see like, okay, here's the stuff I need to get done today. And if I remember to look at it, I will do maybe like 30% of the things on that list, which is great. Um, but the other thing you're really hinting at is like, it's not about whether like, you know you need to do them or not. It's how do you actually force your body to do them when it's screaming at you no. And that is the hardest thing of all. So um, I have found a few things work for me there. Um, the trick is to, like, the, the trick and also the hardest thing is like you need to force your body into hyper-focus sometimes when it doesn't want to. Um, and I have found when I have a bunch of like little mundane things, I will either pick the easiest thing or the one that looks the most interesting but the most important part for me is just starting um and i will throw my computer into do not disturb mode um i will try to hold myself up in like the quietest place in my workspace or home that i can um and quit everything except the stuff i need open to just do that thing because i want to like get all the distractions out of the way um and usually if i start working on the thing I've been putting off. I will eventually build up enough inertia. Um, I think I actually saw Omri describe this earlier as like, you know, like building up, um, I think it's like building up momentum or like building up a train of thought, similar kind of concept. Like I just need to get that inertia going and then I'm, then I'm all set. But like getting there in the first place is really, really hard. Um, the other thing for me is when I'm in a very distracted kind of mood, I sometimes find just getting away from a screen altogether is the best thing I can do. Um, so taking a walk or getting outside and being around nature um, really work particularly well for me. Um, there's been some research on, it's called green time, how being around like trees or animals um, can really kind of like help like calm and focus an ADHD brain a little bit. Um, doesn't work for everybody, definitely works for me. Um, 
But so like sometimes if nothing else is working, I'll just take my dog for a walk outside. And then a half hour later, 20 minutes later, come back and um, sit down and try to get some stuff going. The other thing that really, really sucks though in a corporate environment is meetings. Like um, I, I, I saw a tweet that linked to an article the other day um, about something called waiting mode for ADHD folks. So like if you finish a task and you have a meeting coming up sometime in the next 20, 10 to like 40 minutes, instead of starting another task, you'll go into waiting mode because you know that as soon as that meeting or thing happens, it's going to interrupt your train of thought. And that's really painful. So, um, uh, and then, you know, the reason you do that is because getting going is such a like momentous task that it sucks to just get started and then get interrupted. And if you're in hyper-focus and you get interrupted, it's like physically painful. Um, so, um, yeah, I've also started just chucking large chunks of time on my calendar where people can't book things. Or I, I actually, I recently quit my job, um, which has been great because my side business as an educator has gotten big enough that I can do that. But when I had a corporate job, I would just block out huge chunks of time um, to minimize those kinds of interruptions because they also made, like, you know, I'd just get started on this list of like backlog tasks and then like a meeting would happen and I'd be set back like two hours, which sucks. And we can talk about like work accommodations in a little bit too, but I do see a bunch of other folks who have hands up. I know the code goddess had hers up for a little while. And I also see Brennan has his hand up as well. Um, code goddess. I apologize. I don't know your real name, but um, let's start with you because I saw your hand up first. Awesome. Thanks. Um, no worries. Yeah. I'm Amber. I just, oh, I just awesome. sat there cause I didn't know. Like no, I, no, no, that's totally cool. The code goddess I, fits. You're I rad. It's awesome. Her persona is, is I love it. We don't know. So don't, don't, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll probably forget Amber. I will refer to you as the code goddess for the rest of this talk. I apologize. That, that totally works. Yeah. Um, so, so really quick, I did want to circle back a little bit to where, you know, I talked about how the pandemic broke me, but one of the really cool things that I did get to experience is for the first time in my life, I actually figured out what ADHD was and started learning about like why I do these bazillion things and connecting back to my childhood of all these things I do. Um, and as a developer, I, you know, I completely understood why I would spend three hours writing a script to automate something that you can just do, but it was like, no, I never want to do this thing again. <laughs> so I would write things to automate that and just being able to understand like where that came from. Um, and so what's been kind of a challenge for me is that um, I have moved into management in my career. And so that, um, that great, like, you know, getting those hyper-focused moments, digging into code and things like that have become fewer and far, you know, farther between. And like you were talking about the meetings and everything. And I was sort of curious about this because so right now, um, it, 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 I almost ashamed saying this out loud, but like the worst thing for somebody with ADHD, I'm hiring. So <laughs> I have to put together questions. I have to put together a panel of people and what they're going to ask and all this stuff. And it, like when you talked about it being painful, like physically painful, like some of these things, I, I can feel the sickness in my gut and just like trying to force myself to do this stuff. Um, and I was just curious, I mean, I don't know if yourself or anybody has, has had any experience with, you know, moving into, you know, something that's maybe not as ADHD friendly. I mean, I love the girl, I mean, there's stuff about it I love, um, but like <laughs> how you get over the hump of doing those things is just such a challenge. Yeah, I am. Um, I I have avoided. I've never had a manager role, and that's been on purpose. Um, I just I know it's not for me. Um, more power to you. Um, it's just not not my thing. Um, if anybody else in this meetup has any advice for Amber, I'd love to hear it because I'm utterly useless here. Yeah. So, um, Brennan, by the way. Um, I did previously, uh, before I actually made the switch um, into software, uh, I worked in, in civil engineering and uh, most of the work is product management. Um, and this is before the time I was actually, of course, you always know you have ADHD or something on that line, but you know, until it's really addressed or brought forward to you, you just think, oh, everyone's like this, right? Um, 
So working in that field, uh, product management, especially in civil engineering, very so slow paced, it's tough to get stuff done. Um, I always found that I sort of back to what you were saying earlier, Chris, um, marking, you know, when some, a thought comes to your head and put it down and, and it, I mean, by the end of the day, it's going to look like a jumbled mess. Um, but you'll know how to read it and only you will, but you'll know what it says. Right. So I always actually, and I'm, I'm a pen to paper guy myself. Um, but I do use my notes app, uh, on my phone, but I always find I carry a, almost like a journal or something, or just a, like a notebook with me. Um, anytime I have ideas, anytime I have a thought about, uh, previously it was a project or like a to do, um, because a million of those to do's will come in your head at once. And then you'll only remember one out of 10 things, uh, at the end of the day. So always draw notes, uh, make notes, and then sort of set a time to, um, uh, go over your notes uh, in the evening and then assess them in the morning. Now it's not foolproof. Obviously it's, there's a lot of other things. Cause, uh, again, I quit the industry cause I, the meetings, I was yawning, all this stuff. I couldn't deal with it. So I had to make the switch, but that I always found it. Um, that really helped me just taking notes, making sure of any, any thought that comes away at boom on the thing. So, um, and that will hopefully help with like developing questions and any tasks. Yeah. ADHD is rough because you'll have more ideas in like a year than some people have in a lifetime. Um, way more ideas than you could ever implement, but you also have like a crap working memory. So if you don't put them down immediately, yeah. they just, yeah. So like the computer analogy here is like ADHD folks have um, like a really powerful processor and really bad RAM. Right. So mm -hmm. like, um, you know, there's just, you can only hold like one or two ideas in your head at once. Um, but yeah, you got all cylinders firing all the time. It's so bad. Um, Brendan, you had a question. I saw your hand up. Yeah, I did. And, and I'll even bounce uh, sort of some experience and ideas on what was previously discussed. Um, so as I mentioned, I do the note taking thing, which helps, but I, I know you're sort of talking about that. Uh, you had mentioned earlier, um, sort of getting in that mode, right? Because there, I think everyone here maybe has a separate way of getting that mode, but you know what it is. Um, because I, I know in um, my past, uh, my past job, uh, getting into that mode, um, and like you're saying, you're often told you're lazy or procrastinator, which is true, but you don't know why, right? Um, but I would just, you know, you're, you're procrastinating or you're doing something else, but you'd always not necessarily wait till last minute, but in a time where it's like, okay, I know if I spent if I get in my mode, I can finish this. So, it, you know, if anyone's been in school, it's like doing a paper overnight, right? Um, and then it translates to the workspace. We're always found that, and it was unhealthy, right? Because I get in a, in a mode of stress, right? And that was sort of, I didn't view stress as like a negative thing. It was almost like a, a good thing. It was that stimulus I needed where it's like, and then when you finally were able to finish that task, you're just like, that was amazing. Like, can I do it again, right? Um, so anyways, uh, just moving on to that, um, I found out, you know, that's probably not the best thing to proceed with. Um, so I wanted to find ways where I can sort of not necessarily uh, activate that mode, but make every sort of moment of my day more focused around. Uh, um, and again, not getting into that mindset, but sort of bits of pieces of that mindset. So whether it's intervals or whatever it is, but spacing it out throughout the day and then throughout the weeks instead of doing it all last that month. So um, speaking on that, I, I, you know, I found things, like I said, my note taking was useful, but even things like uh, um, music, I found really useful for myself. Um, but you got to make sure it's not like very lyrical and you almost want like beats or something just to, you know, you, you have like certain playlists that keep you in a certain mindset. Um, and then that's sort of things I've tackled to help with that. But I did want to ask, um, because uh, obviously I'm rambling here. I did want to ask, um, through your experience, Chris, and, and everyone else you're involved, um, what, what did you find, I guess, the most important thing um, while working in that corporate environment? Because I know uh, none of us yeah. like it, but you do have to deal with it. And ADHD isn't necessarily, a, you know, yeah. maybe when we were hunter-gatherers, it might have been a good thing. But now that we're in this corporate lifestyle, it's a, it's a negative. So is it developing a, a strict routine? Is it um, giving yourself some boundaries on a routine or is it some other yeah. version of stimulus that you found 
help it's a few things thoughts? yeah so um uh first of all um i i'm trying to think of the most diplomatic way to phrase this but i am um, you know i we have a society that's really oriented around like neurotypical early births um and um i sometime in the last few years just decided that i um i was done like feeling bad for not fitting or feeling guilty i guess for not not fitting into that um and so I started getting really like clear and honest with my managers about both having ADHD and what that meant for me and like what I needed in terms of like structure and work environment and that kind of thing. Um, now, again, I say this as a white dude who has like a lot of social safety nets. So like I am able to do that. And I understand that some folks like, you know, here right now or watching this later, that might not be the case. Um, you know, I just, I want to fully acknowledge kind of the privilege and being able to do that. But, um, uh, you know, like for me, I, my last manager in the last job I ever had was a micromanager, like a really big micromanager. And um, it, it was a big, I think it really accelerated like the timeline with which I decided to quit. Like I had planned to stick around for a fair bit longer, but um, just kind of this constant like pinging and check-ins and micro, it just does not work for like my work style. Um, and the managers I've had that I've been most successful with have been the ones who will throw like big, interesting tasks at me and then just back all the way the hell off and let me kind of figure it out. Um, and so like really like <clears throat> identifying that that was my preferred work style, communicating that clearly and kind of moving on from managers who don't like gel well with me, um, I think was a really important thing. Um, and also just kind of, you know, like being okay with the fact that like I would have weeks where I would like just get so much done and then other weeks where I would get nothing done. And that was just kind of my normal, like that was my personal cadence. Um, uh, I know that doesn't work for all work environments, all, all people, um, but I, I kind of, I hit a stride where like the net productivity was about the same as everybody else's. I just had more peaks and valleys than like a typical person. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, the other thing is I used to miss meetings all the time, um, all the time. Cause I would get super, super hyper-focused and then like snooze or like a notification about a meeting and then completely forget about it. Um, hit dismiss by accident. And that was it. Um, the biggest thing that helped me there, honestly, was an Apple watch. Um, because having like, here's your next meeting and it's literally right there on your watch and it's going to yell at you a whole bunch until you do it. Um, uh, I also now, like, it was one of those things. My wife was like, you should really get an Apple watch. And I'm like, I don't, I don't think I need one. Like I already have a, an iPhone. How many like electronic devices do I really need around me? Um, the Apple watch has been game changing because I will also do things like start my laundry and then forget to like switch it or turn on the oven to bake cookies and then forget to put them in there or start a pan of water boiling and forget to add pasta. And I now set timers for everything. And the latest watch OS lets you name those timers. So I will like tell Siri, start a timer for 10 minutes called put pasta in pot or for an hour and a half called switch laundry. And you can have multiple ones going at the same time. Um, that's been literally game changing for me. And it shouldn't be, it's such a dumb, stupid simple thing um but that's made a really big difference um yeah those have really been the biggest ones um you know just kind of like getting comfortable with um who who i am um i just i really like um you know there are limits to the whole like just fully embrace your adhd thing because like we live in a society and you live with other people and like <laughs> You know, like, um, like I am a messy person by nature because I just kind of like re leave a trail everywhere I go. And like, that's great. But like, you know, it doesn't bother me, but it really bothers my spouse. Um, and, you know, like her happiness matters too. Just like, you know, if like if she did something that annoyed me all the time, like 
you know, there's a little bit of a give and take here. Um, so, um, you know, as much as I, I love to say, like, just, you know, fully embrace who you are, um, you know, you need to make sure you're not like imposing on other people too. Um, and finding that balance is, is tough. I don't really have a perfect answer there. Sometimes I'm better with that than, uh, than mm -hmm. others. Yeah. And I find I use timers too a lot. I use the, like the tomato timers, stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, for work production. So it's yeah. helped, a, it's helped a fair amount. It's not a, like you're saying, it's not a full solution, yeah. but it helps. I did know, I Omri mentioned the smartwatch entails a lot of distractions too. Um, that can be the case. One thing I do with all of my devices is I turn off basically all notifications um, for almost everything. Like on my phone, the only thing I really get notified for are phone calls and text messages. Um, so like, Slack, Discord, et cetera, those don't chime on my phone at all. Um, and so like my watch is a very similar thing. Like it only alerts me for calendar things um, and timers. Um, and that's like a very deliberate choice. The other thing too is like, you can't browse the web on a, like on an Apple watch anyways, I'm sure some smart watches you can. Um, and so in that way, it's really like, <laughs> like sometimes I'm bored and I don't have my phone with me and I'll pull up my watch to like, entertain myself and i'm like okay these are my meetings for the next couple of days and oh well, this is the weather in florida right now and then i'm done like <laughs> there's nothing else to do on it for me um so it's it's maybe um a little bit more limited in that regard all right uh, uh, do you want to take some more questions <clears throat> just um yeah if anybody off. if anybody has them um let's see oh corporate lifestyle entail uh, Vivian, could you say a little bit more about that? Um, I want to make sure I, I properly understand the question before I just go off on a like 10 minute rant. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it was Brennan's question, right? Like how, what are some ways to kind of handle the ADHD um, yeah. shenanigans <clears throat> when you're in a corporate um, <laughs> lifestyle? So yeah. I'm trying to figure out what that means. Are you talking about like cubicles and, and people walking around? And you need to go to the office every day and like pencil skirts and stuff. Is that what you mean by corporate lifestyle? Because I don't really, I'm trying to get an idea of what it is for like. Yeah. Like, so it. for, for me, it can be that. So that's part of it. So like part of it is like when you're in an actual physical environment, especially like open office plans where you've got just stuff happening all the time and people pop in. Like when that was me, like when I was actually physically in an office. Um, I used to find open like meeting rooms and go squat in them because it was the only way I could get stuff done. Um, just the, like, especially when I was in an open fun office environment, like there was like music going on and like Nerf gun battles and like people having conversations a foot away from me. And that just did not, that did not work for me. But the other part of it is just, um, even as a remote employee, it is, people pinging you on Slack and people scheduling meetings on your calendar because you had something open. And, hey, we've got this project I really need you to work on because, you know, executive took this pet project that's really important to him that does absolutely nothing to further the actual objectives of our organization, but it's really important to John Smith, the VP. So we have to do it. And if anybody's ever seen Office Space, just like all the TPS report nonsense where like, you need to fill out this timesheet and log your hours, even though you're a salaried employee and we do not pay you hourly and legally cannot track your hours, we still need you to go fill this in. Like just all that kind of BS, um, like mundane work for the sake of doing the work and not because it provides any value. Like that is for me in particular, really like just physically painful and difficult to get done and distracting from like the actual meaningful stuff. Um, like, if you're an ADHD or like turning your attention on anything is really difficult and 15 minutes of busy work translates into maybe like an hour of lost productivity on actual important work just because of the nature of like amping yourself up to actually do it and then the transition time away from it. Um, yeah, so that's what I meant by that. Um, I just, I, I do not do well in corporate environments and most of my ADHD friends have a lot of struggles with those two. Um, and the places where they've done really well, um, are often when they're surrounded by other ADHDers or neurodivergent folks, um, who get it and have like maybe a more asynchronous work style. Not everybody, but that's just kind of been the, 
the pattern I've found. So just list, like listening, sorry, uh, listening to what you just said. No worries. Number one, I will check your LinkedIn so I can avoid that place. <laughs> um, and then also like number two, I guess, <laughs> just I'm trying to like go circle back to like what Brennan's question is, which is like coping mechanisms for this, right? Um, mm -hmm. Aside from just medication, because it can only help so much. Um, what I'm hearing is if there is a certain like, ability to kind of isolate yourself from from external stimulus, which is tra either trapping yourself in the cubicle or like maybe even asking, <laughs> you're just like, no, I agree. Um, like maybe even asking to see if, what I did was I would try to go in a little later, but stay in a little later. And when I do stay later, those times where people are not really there anymore, um, that's when I'm the most productive. So. Yeah, time shifting helps a lot too. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, what was it? So something. So the last place I interviewed at, I ended up not taking the job there. Um, but the last place I interviewed at, um, I was asked a question specifically around: Do you prefer? as you're working on a project, lots of touch points throughout the day, or you go off and do a bunch of work and then you circle back when you're done, and. I told them the latter, like I like to do a bunch of work and then come back when I have something done. And then I mentioned like, oh, you know, it's because I have ADHD and like the lots of touch points thing, like, unless I'm like really stuck and I, I need an answer to move forward, like it just totally breaks my, like my flow. And I discovered that the person interviewing me also had ADHD and her manager, who was the, the person hiring for this role, who would be my boss, also had ADHD. And so did these three other people. And that's all how they preferred to work too. And that would be great. Um, and like that kind of thing is really, really rare. Um, so um, I think one of the one of the things I, I try to be a little bit more um, mindful of now personally is just being a little bit more candid, like early on about like what I need and work preferences. Um, uh, you know, one other thing, this this came up earlier, we talked about, um, or I alluded to accommodations in the workplace. And I, someone definitely said, James, you mentioned you'd like to learn more about that. Um, so this would probably be also a good time to talk about that. So in the US, ADHD is considered a disability. And that means it's uh, covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act which means that you are legally entitled to ask for accommodations at work or school to make your life easier. And many other countries, including Canada and various places in the EU, have similar laws and requirements. Um, some companies may require an official diagnosis first. A lot of times they won't because that's awkward. Um, so um, Jessica McCabe, who runs um, the YouTube channel, How to ADHD, has a really great video on this um, that you can, I've linked to over at gomakethings.com slash um, uh, JavaScript LA. Um, uh, and I'll also pull up a link to that and drop it in the chat right now so you can go find it. Um, but you know, it's a very personal thing. So there's no like cut and paste checklist on this. A lot of it is gonna depend on like what your work style is and what works best for you. Um, but, you know, that could mean, you know, if you're comfortable disclosing that you have ADHD in the workplace, that can mean asking for things like dedicated blocked out time where people can't book meetings on your calendar or, um, you know, adjusted work weeks um, where you um, you have bigger chunks of time where you can focus rather than, you know, like the standard five by eight kind of work day. Or it could, if you have to physically go into the office, mean asking for a quiet, dedicated space, like an office where you can't be bothered so you can actually get stuff done um, that's quiet and not distracting. Um, uh, yeah, so there's all sorts of cool things that you can do when you open up about having ADHD. Now, the flip side of this is I've also heard from like, you know, I had a, a, a friend who had ADHD and, uh, you know, he was, um, uh, um, <laughs> he was a lot of things, but he was black presenting. And so the way he described it to me was he never tells his employers he has ADHD because he already feels like his work is under more scrutiny because of the color of his skin. And he didn't want to give his employer one more like target on his back for them to like micro analyze his work under. 
Um, and so, you know, I'm, I am saying this, you know, just, I need to keep caveating this with a lot of privilege as a white dude. Um, but, um, you know, if you are comfortable disclosing it, there are a lot of things you can ask for in the process of, um, of doing that. Um, yes, there is a Google extension, Vivian, I just saw you mentioned that, um, that shuffles your schedule to allow you to set focus time. There's also different things, like there's, there's actually apps you can use that will like block out everything else except the thing you're working on, including putting like a semi-opaque overlay over it so that like it's visually harder to see. Um, there's lots of like really cool apps and things. I've just ultimately found for me that like the best tools for me are the ones that are um, like most bare bones. Um, but uh, yeah, anything that can block out time on your calendar is great too. I'm sorry, I've been rambling. I'm going to shut up. Uh, Brennan, I saw you threw your hand up. If you have anything to add, please, by all means. <clears throat> You're on mute, by the way. Sorry, I was trying to use the keyboard extension. I was clicked off the Zoom. I think uh, I think it was uh, the code goddess, as we're calling her. Um, I think you were first, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll let you oh, I didn't even notice Amber's hand up. Brennan, no thank problem. you so much. No, Amber, okay, sorry, about that. sorry, it disappeared over the image in her background. Sorry. Thank you for calling that out. Amber, what's up? Hey. Um so just, I just want to touch on a couple things. Um, so first off, I, I am one of the people who thrive in a corporate environment. Um, it is, it, it actually helps with my ADHD. And I mean, I, I work at Disney. You want to talk corporate, that's corporate, right? <laughs> um, so it, that, and that's why when I started working from home, I, I felt broken because I lost all those things that I didn't realize were the crutches I had to get me into a particular mode of work and things like that. Um, and, and so one of the things I, you know, I obviously had to learn how to replicate a lot of that here, but I'm also the person who um, I need to hear sound. Like I loved being in an open office and loved that I could sort of hear because it would keep this part of my brain just a little busy so that I could, you know, do things that were kind of boring. And I think that kind of speaks, you know, in all to, like we said before, everybody's ADHD is different. And the thing that I feel like, you know, and I went on over the, the, the last two years was a journey of really understanding myself. And, you know, what were the things that I was just naturally doing to make things easier for myself? And one of the things I had discovered was when I had to do something really boring in code, I would listen to an, a podcast or an audiobook. Um, and I didn't realize what that was doing for me. And I think that's going to be the biggest thing is discovering for yourself what, you know, what are your triggers? Like, what are the things that, you know, that, that bother you the most? For some people, they need quiet. In fact, I actually had one of my developers um, was ADHD and like, he was the one headphones on, leave me alone, you know, don't do that. And like I said, I was the one who actually got anxiety wearing headphones. I was always anxious about not being fully aware of what was going on. Uh, the other thing too, is that You'll find something that'll work and it'll change. One day it'll stop working. And I just, I think it's super important for everybody to understand it happens to all of us. Like, like you're, there's nothing wrong. You didn't break. It's, it's terrible because you're like, this used to work. Um, you know, for me, for my commute into Burbank, um, you know, uh, audio book, books used to work. And then one day it just stopped working just completely stopped working. And that horrible drive <laughs> into Burbank for an hour was miserable and I had to find something else. And, and that's really like the thing that, that we have to do is we have to really get to know ourselves, really understand you know, where, what are our triggers, things like that, and, um, and just work around those. And then I feel like when you do go to your boss, you have, it, it's better like when you go to your boss as opposed to, Hey, I have ADHD. Okay, <laughs> cool. You know, um, I happen to have one of the most amazing bosses on the face of the planet. So he actually is completely aware and I, and I kept him in the conversation. Um, but I was doing some therapy along with this. And one of the things that she had said is, you know, don't just come to your manager with, Hey, I have ADHD, like understand, like come with, what do you need? What do you want to ask for? 
Because one of the things that I asked for was body doubling because I had found places online that were, um, you know, doing this, this thing where you, you log in for like 45 minutes with somebody and you're like, all you had to do is tell them, hey, I'm working on XYZ. Cool. Everybody muted, but the camera was on and you got to work and you did stuff and, and, and things like that. Uh, so being able to go in with here are my triggers, here are things that I have issues with, here are some things I would like to help with that. And then I would prep, I did say after that, FYI, I'm ADHD. These may not always work. I may come to you with more things. That was terrific. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think the the key takeaway for me was the whole like, know yourself, everybody's different thing, for sure. Um, <clears throat> I just want to like, you know, keep us on track with time and everything. Just that's my job, <laughs> moderating. Um, so it is 7.30. Um, did you want to like continue um, taking questions or do you want to like talk about a specific um, thing that resonated from some of the conversations we had so far? No, no, I'm happy to keep, keep taking questions. Um, for sure. I, uh, I know, I know Brennan also had his hand up, so I want to make yeah. sure he gets to ask whatever. Um, and if anybody else has anything, I will probably start to run out of steam in the next, like, let's say 20 minutes or so. Um, but I'm good for a little bit longer. Perfect. Awesome. Um, my question, I guess, to bring it back to sort, sort of the coding side of things as well, um, and integrating both, um, cause I know some things I deal with and I'm sure everyone knows what they deal with, you know, on a day to day with coding, uh, in general. Um, but do you have any, uh, recommendations or have you outlined any sort of significant issues you face, um, like when doing the day to day coding or, or anything like that? And like, for example, myself, I guess, just to give an idea of what I'm trying to get a grasp of, um, you know, if I'm handed uh, a code for revision, you know, a big app, something with a, a lot of documentation in it, and, you know, you have to go snuff out issues or problems or, or things like that. And I mean, that's our, the most daunting task, at least for someone myself, because it's it's not only where do you start, um, but what's the end product look like? And, and you can't really visualize that. And it's, uh, and so it's just taking it piece by piece. But um, was there anything like that or uh, that you, you've come across or in your own uh, experiences? Yeah, that's a great one. Um, so there's two things here. Um, and they, they almost feel kind of opposed. But um, so one of them is I have a really tough time working on something if I don't know like what the, what the big picture kind of like vision for it is. Um, but just personally for me. So, um, you know, like I like to understand why we're doing a particular thing um, before I before I work on it. Um, and that doesn't always work. Um, sometimes the answer is like, well, just because so-and-so asked for it. And uh, I was like, well, that's 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 stupid. That's not a good reason. Um, so that, you know, that's that's been a challenge. Um, but um, the other the other thing for me that um, really transformed the way I code um, is um, if a project is really big, getting started can be really difficult. Um, and one of the things I've started doing is before I even touch my, like I'll set my computer aside, I grab a notebook and a pen and I map out the app or the project on paper first. And I don't just mean like write pseudocode. Like I will, it just as an example, right? Like, let's say you have like a tip calculator app. I will draw the fields and the button, and then I'll like scribble in notes around like, you know, we need to collect this type of data and it needs to be in this form. And when the user hits this button, we need to do these things. And, you know, for the tip calculator, it might be like, okay, we need the bill total and the percentage they'd like to tip. Both of those need to be numbers. Um, you know, the bill amount has to follow this particular format. And then when they hit submit, we need to take this field, divide it by 100, multiply it by this other field. You know, I'll literally just start breaking down like what's involved in this app. And I write it just in, in, in English. So I guess that part is pseudocode, but it really starts with me like drawing the interface and thinking about like the pieces. And then when I'm done, I basically have the map for how to code it. 
Um, and it becomes a lot easier to just look at the reference and start pulling in all of these different pieces and connecting the dots. Um, but uh, that may not work for everybody. Um, I tell all of my students to at least give that a try because a lot of them get overwhelmed as beginners with like bigger stuff. Um, uh, it works for some, I'd say about half of them. The other half like doesn't really do much for them. Um, but that has been for me, absolutely transformative. Um, largely just because my crap working memory can't keep all the, like the moving pieces, like in my head at once. And so I need to get them like in some quick, like I can look at it and see the whole thing and then jump back down into the minutia kind of, kind of thing. And that's been the best way I've found to do it. I've tried all sorts of like, you know, they have the like, uh, like flow charts and like free form. Like I do it. This, this is the thing that works for me. Your mileage may vary. Yeah. Well, and that's very interesting though, because that's what, um, like part of my learning was uh, dealing using like schematic like schemas and, and flow charts and diagrams like that to sort of map that out beforehand. Um, but yeah, those are always they're always I find them a bit mundane, right? Because it's just mm -hmm. basic. So that's that's a really good take on it. Sort of uh, see what you want visually, and then map all the parts on the actual sort of what you want the end goal to look like. If that does say that, so that was great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Amber, I see you saying, am I the only one whose first pass at coding functionality is an absolute mess? No, but I also think that's literally every coder. Um, I, actually, I had this argument on Twitter the other day because I'm that guy who argues with the trolls um, about like some, some, woman, some woman had mentioned like something about like, you know, her, her sloppy code and some dude, cause it's always a dude was like all up on her about like how, you know, you should never admit to writing sloppy code. And it's like, dude, come on. Like everybody's code is sloppy the first time you write it. And if you say it's not, then you're, you're either lying or you have no self-awareness. Um, most of the stuff that I publish has been through like two, three passes at least. Um, just because like, you gotta get it like out there and working and then you can, then you can, you can clean it up. Yeah, I just I wanted to comment on that because I actually worked with a developer who wrote their code the first time without needing like any linting or any like like issue like he would like I'm going to do the flow types I'm going to do this and I'm like I can't think that way whatsoever that's just not the way my brain works and I remember he uh he was trying to like onboard me with doing some stuff and learning some of their different patterns and he's like that's got a linting error. He's looking at my ID and I was like, yeah, so <laughs> I'm just trying to get it working. He's like, no, no, you have to rename that or you have to do X, Y, Z. And it was, it was just kind of crazy for me because I do, I like for me, um, my, my um, process is that get it working, just like shove stuff in here, get it working. And then I go through, and once I, I now have the full scope, like you were talking about, like really seeing how all the pieces work together, then mm -hmm. I do the pass where I just clean things up and I'm like, oh, wait, I don't need to do X, Y, Z here. I can, you know, do something up here and get that value and, and things like that. And I end up like in the end having fairly clean, concise code, but my very first pass is a complete disaster with the worst named variables on the face of the planet. It's just crazy. It sounds like your coworker may also be neurodivergent. Um, although, uh, to be honest, I've come to believe that the idea of being neurotypical is a bit of a myth and everybody's a little neurodivergent in their own unique kind of way. Um, but yeah, no, I'm exactly the same with my code. It's a hot mess. Um, and then it eventually looks <laughs> somewhat passable. Um, and then it gets passed through like a, a minifier and it looks like gobbledygook again and none of it really matters. Um. You have a question from Adam or hand up. Oh, Adam, I'm so sorry. I didn't notice your hand up. up. Thank you. You're good, no worries. Uh, yeah, no, I guess I, I, I guess I wanted to ask, uh, we are obviously working on, on work stuff, but I, I think moving over to, to learning. Um, for the last two years, I've been working basically at boot camps doing like support instructional. Um, coming from a two years of web development which like was for small marketing firms and and small businesses that like i don't know why they had a tech department but they did 
uh, and just kind of had to look busy and do your best to look like you were a developer with no with no developers around. Uh, so uh, I kind of learned, obviously, self-taught. I think the last two years of teaching has really helped me feel more comfortable about explaining things. Uh, I think I I think a lot of your articles made me realize. I think the the approach to my learning right now is like take a bunch of sources of of a concept, right? Take as many sources as you can. Take the parts that you like from that and form that into some kind of opinion that makes sense to you. And then I throw it through my filter of my five year old daughter. If she like understands it, then it's probably going to work for everyone. Uh, again, because of the boot camp, mm -hmm. I want to make sure I have a, you know, but mm -hmm. I, I, all this to say, I guess, uh, how uh, I'd love to hear your approach on 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 learning. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously, uh, yeah. there's a lot of stuff, right? But I, I'd say specifically, like, how, if you had to, like, obviously, you have a lot of articles, and you've, you've thought about a lot of that. This, if you had to have a like concept, what, what would you kind of do now to kind of like, uh, yeah, get a, get an understanding, be able to explain <clears throat> So I, I can't learn anything until I actually try to do it. Um, and so for me, um, what I typically do is I will have the thing I want to accomplish. And like when I was first learning, that was something like really simple, like click a button, show a thing, click the button again, hide the thing, you know, like a disclosure component or whatever. Um, uh, you know, a more recent example might be like, um, I want to... Um, uh, I want to build a, like a notes app that saves data in like a serverless database and I can access it from anywhere. Um, and then I do my whole like on paper thing. And then for everything that I need to do or that I've identified as like a step that I don't know how to do, I just Google and I try. So it's like copy pasta. And then I'll look at the copy pasta and I'll be like, okay, but why does that work the way it does? Let me understand that better. And once I, th this is the thing that keeps me from shipping copy pasta is the teaching aspect, because I need to be able to explain why the thing I did actually works. So if I can't do that, then I start Googling more to understand like what, you know, what is this thing doing in this code? And I want to be able to explain every single line of it. Um, and then as I learn little bits and pieces, like I won't wait until I'm done. As I learn little bits and pieces, I throw that thing into an article and ship it out onto the web. Um, and that is primarily for my own benefit, or it started primarily for my own benefit anyways, because if I don't do that, I forget it. Um, and so my blog literally for like the first few years it was in existence was exclusively a place for me to not forget the stuff I learned. And even to this day, I'll sometimes Google like how to do something and I'll find an article I wrote or a question I asked on Stack Overflow that got answered and I forgot about. Um, and that's always really um, kind of like an interesting thing. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my process. Um, for me, it's very project focused and then just kind of trying to back my way into working code. Um, uh, yeah. Cool, thank you. No worries. Excellent. Um, do we have any more questions or um, do we wanna kind of start to like uh, go into like, um, you know, Chris's, uh, you know, uh, website and his blog and, you know, how we can find him and all that. Yeah, unless anybody has anything burning, I am probably running out of steam a little bit. So it might be good to transition into it. And I'm going to join the Discord so we can keep chatting. Um, yeah. yeah, perfect. Um, and just I always need new things to distract me. So another yeah. Discord is perfect. Yeah, yeah, and just perfect. Um, so I, I left some links for uh, people who are new to this uh, group and, you know, just joining in from somewhere. Um, you know, you can, um, a lot of people ask, where's the video? How do I get the video? Um, pretty much. Uh, if you go to youtube.com slash hackbuddyorg, um, and I put that as a link in this chat here, and afterwards I'll put a subtitle for it in the video, um, you can see the video uh, on YouTube there. Uh, we have a Discord link, uh, as everybody has mentioned so far. It's a good way to chat with everybody after, you know, a meetup, and, you know, just keep, keep in touch. I really like Discord. It's a lot like Slack if you use Slack or any kind of chat, um, chat application. And then um, if you want to connect with me directly, I'm on LinkedIn and I've also shared my LinkedIn as well. And uh, I'm saying that just basically in case you want to, you know, maybe like you want to share an experience too, or, you know, you want to talk about a software engineering topic. Um, it's a great way to, you know, um, just connect and talk to me about that as well. And then uh, we can see if we can schedule you for a meetup down the line. 
All right, uh, let's go to uh, Chris. And I guess if you want, you can kind of uh, lead us out, um, you know, to the last part of your, your talk today, if you want. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah, not, uh, not really much. Um, just, um, you know, uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you all for asking some really like good questions. Um, I probably could have just rambled for an hour, but I think it was way awesomer to like have other folks share their experiences and get some questions. So thank you for that. Um, if you want to learn more about me or dig into any of the stuff we talked about or even some of the stuff we didn't in more detail, um, you can find me at gomakethings.com. Uh, and if you go to gomakethings.com slash JavaScript LA, uh, you can find a bunch of stuff specifically about what we talked about today. Um, uh, you can also find links to my Twitter and uh, my email address. So if you wanna like, continue this chat uh, some more, I'm always happy to talk about ADHD, vanilla JS, and uh, coding in general. Well, thank you all so much. It was really great. Yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks for this meetup. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah. Any last Cheers, questions? It, we're, we're good. It's been great. OK. All right. Thanks a lot. I'll see you all. I'll see you all. Um, see you on Discord. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody, for sharing. It was great. Bye. Yeah, thank you.